and when we got rid of him, everything will be fine in Yugoslavia. As stupid a theory as the one says that without Mohammed Farah Aidit in Somalia, everything will be fine in Somalia. Without Saddam Hussein in Iraq, everything will be fine in Iraq. 74 was my first visit to Yugoslavia, and I think I've been there about 100 times since then, back and forth, doing missions, writing about it. We produced in my foundation the largest ever report written about Yugoslavia's dissolution and why it should not have happened that way. It fell apart for a lot of reasons. If you want the 30 second short one, this was a group marriage. Group marriages are difficult. The West exploited the fragmentation that they could use in, if you will, history's traumas. I mean, both the Croats and the Serbs and the Bosnian Muslims have their traumas from the Second World War, where uh, thousands of people were killed. So they could have been, uh, if you will, saved by different Western policies if that was what the West wanted. But the West always wanted to split. DVD et impera. Split and rule. Divide and rule. And so you, they saw the possibility of getting all these small republics, uh, which they could rule and one by one get into the European Union and then NATO. Something that should never have been done. It was painful for many of us who knew Yugoslavia, loved Yugoslavia, I considered my third country, to see what happened without any knowledge about the complexity because Yugoslavia is, was, probably intellectually the most complex conflict anywhere on earth and it's characterized with if you do a little thing here it will have repercussions here throughout Yugoslavia. They didn't understand that, they didn't understand the autonomy uh, solutions that Kosovo was part of, autonomous province part of Serbia like Vojvodina was an autonomous part of Serbia. And so they invented the idea, for instance, that Slobodan Milosevic, whom I met and carried messages back and forth to the Kosovo Albanian leadership for, that he had a genocide going on the Albanian people. Clinton went up and said, in Milosevic we have a new Hitler in Europe. And in the moment you say Hitler, you know, you can get people to believe anything because it's so complex that nobody understands anything. There were not five people in the Ministries of Foreign Affairs of the European Union who knew anything substantial about the complexities of Yugoslavia. So everything they did was wrong. It's as simple as that. Everything they did was wrong. They were ignorant. They were totally ignorant about the complexities, the histories, the structures, the economies and all that and how it worked together. It was a formidable statesmanship to keep Yugoslavia together. All the religions, all the nationalities, all the histories, all the traumas. The solution, of course, was to put in again, at already at that time, pump in weapons. And who did the West pump in weapons to? To those who had been with Hitler and Mussolini, the Croats, the Bosnian Muslims, and the Kosovo Albanians. All had good relations with the Western fascists. Serbs were the one who paid the price, fled to Norway. They were the ones who were slaughtered in Jasenovac, together with Jews and Gypsies. Or... And we didn't side with those because we said, Serbs are the bad guys. And why are the Serbs the bad guys? Because they were the small Russians, the wrong Christians, the Orthodox, whom we can't in the Protestant world can't trust. And then they had a dictator, his name was Slobodan Milosevic. And when we got rid of him, everything will be fine in Yugoslavia. As stupid a theory as the one says that without Mohammed Farah Aidit in Somalia, everything will be fine in Somalia. Without Saddam Hussein in Iraq, everything will be fine in Iraq. Without um, uh, Gaddafi in Libya, everything will be fine in Libya. This obsession with focusing on the top leader and think if we get rid of him, everything will be fine. I want to give you a personal story. In 99, as we know, NATO bombed. 
the hell out of the place in order to get a second Albanian state in Europe. Very unusual, namely Kosovo as an independent state, which of course is the cradle of Serbia and they wouldn't accept that as an independent state. Shortly after that bombing, I had a meeting with the then president who had taken over after Milosevic. His name was Vojislav Kostunica. I sat with him in his dark little personal flat in Belgrade, and he didn't live in a big posh place. He said, Jan, I want you to know that we've just been told by NATO, who destroyed us a few months ago, and used depleted uranium we weapons. We've just been told that we will not be able to enter the European Union before we become members of NATO. Think of the arrogance that you first destroy, pulverize a country, cut out a part of it. It's much worse than anything Russia has ever done in, in, uh, in Ukraine and Crimea. And then you say, you must become a member of our, of our destructive organization before you can enter the European Union. So I think that Yugoslavia maybe could not be kept together, but it could have been split in a much more peaceful way. And then comes, of course, the, uh, <laughs> the very bizarre story, as you mentioned, in which the corner of the Chinese embassy, slightly outside the center, was destroyed. And my Serbian friends in Belgrade said at that time, we have redefined what CIA is. It now stands for can't identify anything. Because they allegedly said that it was bombed by mistake. And when the bombing started by NATO in Kosovo and Serbia, people ran down to Macedonia. 800,000 disappeared into that. And the West tried to tell us, I mean, those of us who were there knew it was one big lie tried to tell us that the 800,000 people had run from Milosevic's ethnic cleansing, whereas it happened a few days after NATO's bombing had started. And, you know, asking Macedonia first to have destroyed its economy thanks to the sanctions and then take care of 800,000 refugees, that was enough to destroy that country's, uh, let's say, livelihood. Did we ever pay compensation? Did we ever say uh, we apologize for what we did? Strong people, decent people are able say, to say, I'm sorry. But low level people, less intelligent, less mature people always think that they always do everything right. And that's a dangerous philosophy for the rest of the world, particularly when you have too many guns in your hands. It gave me something to reflect about what it means to have too much power. The Americans have had too much power and never been humble. And God forbid anybody of the new multipolar world leaders will go the same strange way. That because we have succeeded with certain things, we are no longer humble. The more you succeed and the more power you have, the more humble, the more careful, the more thinking you should do instead of getting, getting to the arrogance of power. As we know, China has come into Serbia done very good work there, and it, Serbia is basically part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And the interesting thing is, if you look at the railway building there, it has gone very nicely in Serbia, which is not part of the European Union. But the part of the railway up to Budapest is not ready yet because of EU bureaucracy. So I would advise Mrs. von Leyen to keep her mouth shut about international affairs and see to it that her own union works. And stop talking about Europe because, dear madam, You've never been elected. You profess to be a leader in a democratic European Union with 410 million people, but you've never been elected. And many of these leaders, government leaders, are war criminals, but they will never be convicted. I could give you an example. I live in Sweden, I've done that for more than 50 years, but I was born in Denmark and have followed Danish politics closely all these years. It was an extremely peaceful country where we used to say, if we disagree about something, let's drink a beer and talk. Um, in the 90s, something crept in, probably because the Social Democratic Party, as in all other European countries, are no longer Social Democratic parties, but right-wing um, militarist-oriented countries. Uh, powers or yeah, countries and governments. And in 99, 
Denmark decided with a social democratic and a liberal party to bomb in Yugoslavia, in Belgrade, during the dissolution wars of Yugoslavia. After that, Denmark has participated in bombing in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Iraq. It was a main destroyer together with Norway of Libya, which were way outside the United Nations mandate, which was to protect people basically, but they pulverized Libya. And then Syria and Iraq again. And now the prime minister of Denmark is, is basically a megaphone for Washington. Madame Fredriksen was actually for a period a candidate, a possible candidate to become NATO secretary general. And you may be aware that the Danish prime minister uh, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, who is with no doubt the largest Danish non-convicted uh, war criminal, it made Denmark participate in four years of occupation with the Americans of Iraq against the United Nations, against international law. He was rewarded for that by the Americans and was a personal friend of the Bush family. He was rewarded for that occupation illegal occupation, by becoming a Secretary General of NATO. So my little country is, is <laughs> among the worst in Europe. Why do you so adamantly pursue peace, which sounds like so in, unreachable and so idealistic? Um, why do you dedicate your life to that? Very sweet of you to ask that question. Of course, you, you may think I had a very unhappy childhood and things like that. It's not the case. Probably I had a very happy childhood. No, um, that has very much to do with having met people who persuaded me that this was uh, a better thing to do. When I became a sociologist, I thought I would work with industrial sociology. You know, how do workers work in factories and how do we make them more happy and things like that. But I found out that sociology could be used at the global level. And before that, I was at a high school in Aarhus, Denmark. I think I mentioned that I was born in Denmark. And there I had a headmaster of the school who was out of the normal. And I will always be very grateful to him. He would come in and say, well, the teacher in mathematics today is ill and I will uh, teach you this lesson here in, uh, instead. But I'm not too interested in mathematics, but I'd like to talk with you when I'm, about when I met Einstein. And he talked about Albert Schweitzer, whom he had met, and he was a staunch believer in nonviolence and Gandhian thinking. He wrote books about generals who at the time in the 50s and 60s were for disarmament. So this dear man, Oka Bertelsen, gave me in a very important period of my life between 16 and uh, 18, at high school level, some inspiration. I can say that he and his wife were also the main organizers of the rescuing of Jews from Denmark to Sweden during the Second World War, and he wrote a book called October 43. So I got pacifism and nonviolent thinking and Gandhian into my high school. I mean, today that type of school leader would be impossible. He would be stopped for political censorship or something like that. And then I ran into a peace research at Lund University, a dear friend, uh, professor of sociology, Hakan Wieberg, who gave a little five-point course, two months of peace studies, and I said, wow, I'm not going to do industrial sociology. I'm going to do peace studies and work globally. And he took me down, and now it comes a full circle. He took me down to Dubrovnik in 1974 and said, Jan, something is interesting is happening down there. At the time when Johan Galtung, the Norwegian world leader in peace, uh, some call him the father of peace studies, were the director of the center in Yugoslavia. And I said to Johan, do you remember where we met? And he said, no, I don't remember. We met here in 74. No, I said, we met in 68 at my high school in Aarhus, Denmark, because the rector there had invited Johan Galtung to come and speak. And so I've been a pupil of Johan Galtung and other people, of course, since then. And I would like to um, um, disagree with one formulation of yours. Peace is not 
unrealistic. It's not even idealistic. It's damn rational. And no limits to what people can achieve together if they could stop fighting each other, using weapons, wasting m m human, technological, economic resources on militarism. There's no limits. Humanity can do the most incredible things, but we can't do it if we kill each other. And if we spend all our awakened time on finding out how to make each other's enemies and how to speak bad about other people and speak about uh, enemies everywhere instead of... Why do we have enemy analysis? We don't have friendship analysis. So if you ask me, the totally unrealistic paths are those who have nuclear weapons and keep on doing militarism and armament and produce new weapons all the time and waste tremendous ecological, human, intellectual and cultural resources on such a stupid thing. It's a disease of humanity, more or less in different parts, but it exists everywhere. And if we could stop that, I know that's a big thing and I may not see that in my lifetime, I'm 72. But if we could stop it, and that's a vision I have, we do our best, my wife and I and the 50 people at the TFF, we do our best to prepare for the period that comes after the warfare and after the militarism, after the empire of the United States has gone. Now, when that has declined, like the Soviet Union has declined, we will, create, we will be able to create a much better world. The only doubt I have is not that that is right. The doubt I have is, will the United uh, States empire go down with a bang or with a whimper? Gorbachev was a formidably visionary and uh, peaceful person who could have blown up the world with his nuclear weapons and say, okay, the Soviet Union is gone, socialism is gone, we have lost the game, boom. Hitler could have done it if he had had nuclear weapons in his bunker in Berlin. We don't know who sits in the White House the day the Americans find out that we have no empire, nobody's listening to us anymore, we've got to change. Will you go down with a bang or a whimper? I hope it will be a whimper. I hope the United States will go down with grace and not go down in the sense of becoming a third world country or something like that, but go down from its empire. Stop imperialism, stop militarism, stop dominating. That will make the United States a much better country and it will make a much better world. The only thing you must promise me never to say is that peace is less realistic because the most unrealistic is to keep on doing what we do at the moment and hope that humanity will survive. Either we will not survive because we blow it up in nuclear weapons or some other kind of mass warfare, which we are closer to now than we have ever been since 1945. So it is realistic by any standard to work for the reduction of violence. And it's unrealistic to work for the increase of violence. And that's my background. And I am stubborn enough to keep on doing that until I can neither speak or think or talk anymore. I vojnik neki tuč i strah. Svako ima Što 
kod smo dalje Sve više hoću Da znam gde živi Gde pije peva Gde je sad Moja generacija I šetrde se druge Sva se već pože Peace.